Well, I think you cannot run away from the fact that um, early, you know, in the early years, even before the um, uh, independence of Singapore, um, that a lot of the ID advances or control of ID was primarily due to um, environmental health uh, or environmental changes. So say for example, better water uh, supply, uh, less overcrowding, uh, better uh, uh, sewerage disposal, waste disposal, that all those have actually contributed uh, a great deal, yeah, both in a lot of countries in the West uh, as well as in Singapore. I mean, I, I, I would call that phase of uh, public health uh, in Singapore as, uh, in a sense, public health 1.0. Uh, that a lot of the improvement in the health of the population and in particular at that time ID was the main issue um, is not due to doctors, not due to uh, public health, so-called public health professionals but uh, environmental engineers right? and, and I think we've got to recognize that and then I suppose the, the next phase is uh, where we have what I would call public health 2.0 yeah. Um, where we found, say, specific agents yeah, that uh, causes uh, infectious diseases. So you have smallpox, you have uh, uh, measles and so forth. And uh, where vaccinations now become the answer. Okay? So uh, through vaccinations, through the school health services that, that uh, Singapore uh, uh, had, um, that infectious diseases were very much uh, in control okay? and uh, newer vaccinations were introduced including things like uh, hepatitis B for a chronic disease right? like uh, you know, the, uh, liver cancer. So, so the, the link between the uh, vaccination for infectious disease with, uh, with a chronic disease, that, that is another phase of development. Um, but I think moving forward, uh, we, we have to, to look at uh, uh, the next um, major milestone that, that would happen would be in terms of infectious disease control would be what I would call uh, public health 3.0 where things are much more complicated, where things are actually at systems level no longer an issue of, say, if I have a vaccine, that's it. Okay. Um, there will be many, many more factors that, that needs has interplay in terms of uh, controlling of those infectious diseases. Okay. So that would be a phase of uh, public health uh, 3.0 you know, in that sense. I mean, SARS is in, in particular, I mean, was uh, involved in a small way uh, during SARS. And, and now, in hindsight, looking at it, um, I would say probably three Cs. Right? Um, the first is actually the need for coordination. When you have an outbreak of this kind of uh, intensity and magnitude, um, that there, should, there is or there was a whole of government approach but a whole of government approach that led to a whole of society kind of action. Um, so the need to have that kind of coordination is very crucial. So take for example during SARS, um, the labs were kind of um, uh, uh, overwhelmed at one hospital and the need to transfer the specimens from one hospital to, to other laboratories. Um, you know, there, there was no system in place to, to, to do that, you know, and then the, getting the results back and so forth, there was no system in place to do that. The private sector came in to help. So the SAMCOP, for example, the, provided the logistics in terms of sending samples uh, from Tan Tok Seng to, to other hospitals, to other laboratories. Um, so that needs coordination. Right? So, so I think the, the first C in the uh, in, uh, outbreak of this kind of scale, or, uh, you, you basically need a lot of uh, uh, coordination. Um, the second C I would say is uh, competence. Right? And competence at the level of, um, from the lab people, from the clinicians, from the public health uh, doctors, figuring out 
what has he does? Okay. Well, what, what is the infectious agent uh, that has been uh, introduced? You know, is this a new disease? Is this an old disease? What is it? Okay. So, so just trying to answer what is it, right? the, the de detective part of, of the job. Um, you must have people who are highly competent to do that. Right? From laboratory scientists to, to, to all the way to the clinicians uh, in the front line. Um, and then at the same time is um, uh, competence of the operations on the ground. Um, so the nurses, uh, the healthcare providers, the porters, the, the technicians, um, are they competent in handling an unknown or highly infectious agent? I mean, Ebola is a classical example where, where you see in the, in, in the, or you hear in the stories whereby um, just improper uh, uh, ungowning okay, can cause an infection to, to take place. So to, to be able to be competent to, to do that, and I think the third uh, C is probably uh, related to that point is uh, the ability to concentrate. Right? That when you have an outbreak, of course, that seems to be the only thing, but, but uh, there are also a lot of other operations that needs to continue on, to, to be going on. Um, so the ability to, to not be distracted and concentrate on the outbreak. Right? All the way from uh, people on the ground, okay, um, two people right on top. You know, how to concentrate on the problem and uh, to tackle it and deal with it quickly and decisively because uh, the, if you don't deal with it decisively then it drags on and people begin to lose concentration and then I think you begin to, to, to have that epidemic. I mean it's like the case of Ebola now, it keeps dragging on um, then you lose concentration and uh, you, you're basically waiting for another outbreak to happen again. And that is quite rare. So, so to me, these three C's are, are very important. Uh, coordination, uh, competence, as well as uh, concentration. Yeah, so, so I agree. So, so um, communication will be, will be another very, very crucial and important uh, uh, piece. And to me, I would, I would say that that is also part of coordination. How do you coordinate yourself such that you give a consistent message? Right? Uh, and in this day and age, the communication is not just about uh, telling people what's happening and deciding uh, how much to tell, how much not to tell. Right? Uh, I think in the past, we have the luxury of uh, being able to say, I decide how much to tell and how much not to tell. In this day and age with the social media, uh, what is not said is sometimes louder than what is said. Okay? So, so I think the need to coordinate uh, almost centrally, I would say, you know, what is the message that, that you want to get out. Right? And at the end of the day, it may be that it's going to be very difficult to manage. That it's easier to just tell it as it is. You know, that the moment you tell it as, as it is, uh, then you deal with uh, what needs to go out, plus what is, you know, may not have been said. Right? So, so I think um, the need to, to, to be able to tell it as it is, okay? and trust that the community out there will be able to manage those information um, may be something that yeah, we need to learn to do. I think there's a certain history okay, to, to this because the, the school um, grew from a department of epidemiology and public health uh, within the medical school. And historically, over all these years, the department has not really focused on infectious disease research. Um, there's always the feeling that infectious disease research is very much closely, or, or public health infectious disease research is very much closely related to microbiology. So the microbiology department, in a sense, has taken a lead in this. 
Secondly, traditional infectious disease research has been uh, uh, focused around organisms. So the dengue organism, you know, uh, chicken pox or hand foot and mouth disease and so forth. So again, it was very medicalized and very uh, much uh, in the realm of uh, microbiology. So that has been the case. And now that we have a school of public health, I don't think we should duplicate that which is being done by the medical school, by the microbiology department. Um, we should deal with issues that are more at the systems level. And also issues that are uh, dealing with uh, more the um, uh, what's happening around the region. Okay? So, so I think in terms of what's happening around the region, the importance of keeping abreast of, and, and having uh, the forewarning of what's happening around the region. Um, for that, one of course is to have research projects in the region, but more importantly I think is to have the network and the contacts. You know? So the, um, uh, our Masters of Public Health program for example, is uh, one very useful way of uh, developing a strong alumni network and it has proven very useful in the past when uh, outbreaks happened in Southeast Asia. Uh, through all these networks we actually can have a good sensing of uh, what's happening on the ground. Okay? So, so one, one aspect is uh, that, that area of network. The, then when it comes to the research, it is not to duplicate the uh, uh, research in, in a lot of various institutes and um, departments, but to go into newer angles, newer way of looking at things. So at systems level, so say for example, the, uh, in terms of uh, drug resistance you know, in, in infectious diseases, in terms of uh, newer approaches, in terms of surveillance for infectious diseases. So rather than specific uh, infectious diseases, but rather in the sense the tools and more cutting edge methods of uh, looking at control infectious diseases. Okay. I think yes, we have, uh, we will always have infectious disease threats, uh, you know, the, emerging infections and all that and uh, it will always be the, the curveball you know? um, and of course operationally uh, we, we must be ready for that and, and all that and I think that all those are happening okay? um, but one frustration perhaps is the existing infectious diseases that we have in Singapore, we, we, we don't seem to have um, almost like got a handle of it. Right? So, so take for example the dengue. Right? Year after year we talk about, yes, there's an outbreak, there's an outbreak, there's a new outbreak and so forth. You know? And, and um, we have pumped in lots of uh, research dollars right? after uh, some of these uh, infectious diseases uh, and, and I think the question is how do we now uh, capture the population health value of that? Right? Um, yes, we can have good biological reasons why are we having uh, resurgence of outbreaks because the herd immunity is down, we control it so well and so forth um, but that is a good biological excuse uh, could we have uh, newer ways of thinking to say that yes, in spite of that, can we do something about it? Okay. Um, whether is it at the area of the vectors or, or, or whatever. You know? so, so, so I think um, there has been a lot of uh, uh, money poured into you know, infectious disease research as well and how do we now capture the value? the population have value of that. Uh, similarly, uh, condition like say hand, foot and mouth disease, right? uh, how do we capture the, the, the value of the research that has been done around that? Mm -hmm. Or even simpler things like say food poisoning outbreaks. You know? uh, how do we have a good surveillance system for example in place right? for, for, for all this? 
So, so I think um, uh, moving forward is yes, there'll be new emerging infections. Uh, let's not be too overwhelmed by that or too caught up by that because in a sense those are the sexy ones. Uh, the less sexy ones would be things like you know food poisoning outbreak, right? Hand, uh, foot, and mouth disease. You know, dengue. Hey, we haven't shown that we have a handle over, the, over all these problems yet. You know? um, so, so why why are we the, you know, pouring so much taxpayers' money and not getting the return in terms of having a, a handle over this? I think we, we have to ask ourselves those hard questions. Um, I think for, for infectious diseases, the, number one, I mean, there is still, and to a certain extent rightly so, that there is a difference between, say, infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases. I think, uh, I, I think we, 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 we can say we try to look for the links and so forth, but to a certain extent, they are quite distinct. So, firstly, I don't see that, um, I, I don't think, and I hope that moving forward, there shouldn't be a competition between, say, infectious diseases versus NCD. Right? Um, and that comes in the form of funding, that comes in the form of uh, manpower, that comes in the form of uh, policy makers, the flavors of the month. Um, and to come to accept the fact that we yeah. really face with dual burden of diseases. You have NCD, you have infectious diseases. Okay? The two must be handled simultaneously. It's not one against another. Okay? Um, so, so I think if that mindset can change, I think that, you know, I think that would be fantastic for Singapore. Uh, right now, I still sense that uh, among the professionals, there's still, oh, okay, this is the era of the NCD. We infectious disease uh, specialists must must shout more. You know, if we don't shout more, we're going to get less resources. Okay? So there's that sense of uh, competition. And then at the policy maker level, is that yeah, you know, we're going to be confronted with NCDs. You know. And then the ID, oh, there's no outbreak. Okay, but, you know, it's not going to cost me votes. It's not going to cost uh, uh, lots of uh, issues. Uh, let, let, let's concentrate on, on, on NCD. And then the next outbreak that happen, you know, then you swing to this side. Uh, a lot of unnecessary energy loss in that oscillation. Right? Um, so to, to recognize the fact that these are actually two quite distinct problems, and that needs to be tackled simultaneously. We need to make sure that there's adequate resources, both funding as well as manpower and brain power, to tackle them. They are equally important, right? and, and not be not not teach them in competition against each other.